Okay, in today's video, we're going to show uh, a few more connections. And this time, we're going to talk about Genesis and its correlations to a Sumerian tale. Now, there are a lot of parts of Genesis, and of course, the Noah's Flood comes from the Sumerian tale of Utnapishtim, where he gets warned and then told exactly how to build a boat. He set a forth on the water, but it was only a 40-day long flood. Of course, 40 is a symbolic number for Enki, and he's the one seen here, but he's also the one who told Utnapishtim through a reed wall how to build the boat and to warn him, so that was the only reason he saved all of humanity. Kind of looks like a palm frond over here at the left that he's reaching out for, but that's actually a bird, like he's releasing a dove or a raven. In fact, in the same story, he releases doves and ravens, and then afterwards builds an altar and so on. And in the Sumerian tale, it tells you that the gods love the smell of burnt flesh like they can't avoid a barbecue. And that's alluded to also in your Bible. Then God says he's never going to do anything like this again, too. And that was also said in the Sumerian tales that they had made the big mistake of trying to kill off men, mankind in the first place. There's a differential in it, though, that says that it's because everybody had become evil, except for he handpicked this one special people. But then after that, everything still kept happening. So whenever you use logic like that, you're only left with the idea that God wasn't able to make good choices. And a lot of times he ends up changing his mind. Things just aren't working out right and so on. And that's not the actual God that we think of nowadays when we think of somebody who's omnipotent. But also in the old days, the way it really was is religion was kind of the science of the time. And people were trying to figure out why the wind blows. And they figured there had to be gods at the corners of the earth and so on, blowing different ways. And that's what made a north, south, east, and west wind. Come up with ideas of how the whole thing got created. Just like I've made at least four of that I know and made connections and correlations to the very first beginning origin ideas in Genesis before the Noah concept even and of course we have Abraham and so on and Abraham really just means big daddy yes well they tell you it's it's he's to grow in numbers and all these type of things but it literally comes out uh, something like that of course that all correlates to ancient tales too and what I've tried to show you here lately because I have to do this in waves whenever I run through this and sometimes it's better to let somebody stew on ideas for a while and then come back on it. Other times I'll hit you back to back with like, okay, you remember we were right here? Here's something else. Here's something else. Here's something else. I think sometimes that gets to be overwhelming and I realize in videos that I've got to go on and show you something different to keep your attention but not to keep your attention like you lose attention on it, but the fact that you don't retain it or catch the gist of it sometimes. That happens all the time with this, and uh, it's because I try to run over you with facts sometimes and do a fireworks show, and then I act like, do you remember the one that was purple and red? And you're like, what? So this ancient Sumerian tale that we're about to go into is another part of Genesis. Like I said earlier, I've shown you about four different versions of this and how that works out and makes connections. I make uh, the hilarious comment sometimes uh, to make, take a jab at Christianity and Judaism, if you will, and basically say, um, well, it starts out and then you have a woman that grows from a rib and eats from a magic tree because a talking snake told her to. And you were like, oh, okay, and, and, like, that 
wasn't some mythological tale that you were listening to. Of course, some people try to overwrite that with the idea, well, that's just trying to look back at how it all started, and, and, and surely the tale didn't keep getting told, but how long has this toll, uh, tale been told? Well, it's, it's as old as time. When people started keeping up with concepts of it, it goes back tens of thousands of years with the idea that people were coming up with how we got created. And it led on into a modern time, and now science shows us a total difference. And now people have a total different outlook on God. And quite often I make the comment that now all of a sudden God was the one that made the Big Bang. That we never knew even happened, and it's not even alluded to in that book in any way. For it acts like whenever the sun turned on, poof, everything started happening on Earth. Well, that's a sexual connotation, too, that they have because there's a sky god father of heaven and then the mother is earth because earth gets impregnated with seeds and then sprouts up plants. Kind of like you'd think of as Osiris as being a father of that situation. But we all understand that this is mother earth. We understand Mother Nature and so on like that. Well, what impinges on Mother Nature? Well, it's something from the sky. Indeed, we believe now, uh, and a lot of people believe now, that we got certain elements and things from planets that had already started and perhaps even had life on them before that had blown up long before. That's the only way we get the advanced elements of us suns and things that blew up. So there actually were solar systems somewhere near us that reformed again like the pillars of creation and they make the connotations in the Sumerian tale that correlates to the Bible that the first starting everything was null and void but if you will look that up in Hebrew it actually comes out to tohu and bohu and that's actually a different way of actually saying Tiamat and Bahamut. Now in one tale this is a cosmic tale of something like the Younger Dryas event happening to us that they thought left us imparted with Kingu, which is our moon. In fact, in the little story, Kingu gets killed, and whenever Kingu gets killed, his face floats around and ends up forever facing Kia, which is Earth, which is Gaia. And if you'll look, that's the man in the moon. And the concept that they have there. So they kind of had an idea of kind of a way that we have it now. That we got our moon and so on that happened. But it's written off in a mythological tale. Like they had already come up with the idea and spoken it in so different ways. That they turned around and wrote it into a myth. Now Sumerian myths are full of puns. And a lot of people don't understand it or get it, but the Greek myths are a lot of times are full of puns. But it's basically based on the words and the way that words and word associations, but also in Sumerian, one word or symbol in cuneiform can mean a few different things. That will become important here in just a second. But as I've shown in the Greek's hand in the Bible in my recent videos, if you haven't seen them, take a look at them there is that situation where they actually take a word's second or third meaning rather than its first blatant meaning and string a whole different idea out of it that means something totally different but that tale seems to follow this thing that you somehow understand and it's because it actually follows the same old tale And the one we're looking at now, as I said, there was the Tohu and Bohu situation. But then there's also that on a smaller, non-cosmic Earth level where they talk about Tohu and Bohu. And of course, this is the abyss and the salt waters and the fresh water. And then the mixing of creatures that formed in salt water and in fresh water ended up spawning forth. And that that was the thing. And of course... They're, they knew the saltwater fish and creatures were totally different than the freshwater creatures, but fish and things like that were so similar 
that it looked like that was the hinging point to where life got created. Because there are variations on a theme left and right of that, fresh and salt water. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So the, they themselves had literally three, four, or five different creation stories that go on and how things came about. And a lot of them are how certain gods showed up and it bloomed to another level in this garden of gods that gets created. Pantheons become real thick. A lot of people know about the Greek gods and everything and how thick that is, but it's literally, literally a mimicry of what went on in Sumer. And you see the same thing in Egypt, where somebody wrote a thing about 204 Egyptian gods. And, and that's not, and like the subset is like, and that's not all of them. So there ends up being a hell of a lot. Whether there's 12, which is symbolic of the zodiac and the world and the stars and everything that goes along with it. It keeps track with time and sacred geometry and everything and the seasons and so on. If you want to look at a people that were really bound by nature and almost living like elves in that type of situation, uh, how we think about kind of in a concept, it's these people here. All the way up into a modern time. And some people make the effort, they say we no longer have that nature in us and everything, but... We've truly encompassed ourselves now and realized the reality of it all, and we're trying to save the planet. And incredibly, the people that brought us this religion and all these things that came out of it and civilization itself are the ones that figured it out. So when people keep talking trash, it's like, you know, without them being behind the idea and figuring it all out and realizing about ruining the ozone layer and all these other things... Of course, in a modern day, they push that as an agenda and it gets far out of hand, but that's not what this video is about. This is about the telling of Genesis that I just can't seem to get to. So the Sumerians had quite a few little envelopes of mythologies that showed you where gods came from and so on. And the one we're talking about today is Enki, which means Lord of the Earth. So whenever you know that Enlil was above him and everything, that was a big change that became like a storm god taking him over. And really in the first essence of it all, there was like Oranos. And what is that? Well, it's like Uranus. It's the farthest or most high god. When it says most high god in your Bible, it's actually telling you that there's a whole lot of them, but this guy's on top agreeing with it just like in Samuel in a few places in there it alludes to the fact that there are a whole bunch of gods but the God of the Israel people is this one person uses the same word people now want to take that to be pagan and all these other things well I've been showing you that the Bible's made out of all the other pagan stories put together as one and therefore it's actually much bigger than it ever was but this pagan thing was driven into you uh, right from the start to make you try to disregard all of this and regard the same story as somehow being fake here but true there. You can't really make it out here, but Inky's wearing a witch hat, but the witch hat also has little horns sticking out of it. And he's got quite a few horns showing he's one of the major gods and so on. Back in the time of Taurus and then Aries or whatever, they were showing this with a symbolical thing. But if people look at that and try to say, oh, that's the devil and everything too. Well, Moses had horns. If you simply look up Moses with horns in like Google Image, you'll see a whole bunch of old depictions where everybody knew that. In the modern day, because of our newer depiction of Satan, where we've turned around and put the hate on anybody that is from this time period here that had the horns in their thing and oh that does the devil that well then who is this oh, that's the devil too they're all demons and all this stuff that you're led to believe it's hilarious demons and angels yin and yang huh and that's a pantheon yeah along with the fact that elohim is plural and we're going to make him in our image Things like that can't be overlooked. They try to so hard. 
So these Sumerian tales roll over a few different ways of things are being told, and now I'm going to finally get to the idea and be able to tell you what I'm going to show here. It doesn't take too long. For the god of the earth ends up mating with Ninharsag. Now, Ninharsag is Lady of the Great Mountain, but she's kind of cognate, I guess you would say, to something that we would know of as Hathor in the Egyptians. But she's the mother of a lot of these other gods. And some of the cool ones that they've got, like the goddess of beer and so on, and a healing goddess that we're going to talk about too, because that becomes important. See, here's Inky again, and you can tell that he's Aquarius, and he's got his foot propped up over Capricorn here. Not the eagle that we no longer use is the same symbology anymore, and, and Scorpio, and we have Venus over here at the left, and if you notice that she's actually an angel. Yeah, this whole wing thing goes way, way back. I've got other videos about that from people that used to let the birds peck away at them and take them up into heaven because they get the closest because they can fly. Well, we can fly now and we haven't run into heaven yet. We've even gone up into space and we realize that we're just in one of these galaxies in a whole big old thing. So God must have been the big bang thing and not just focused on us. But see, that just ruins the whole Bible thing too. Science kind of ruins that idea, but now we try to have a god of the gaps in what's left over. But Nin Harsog, Lady of the Great Mountain or Mountains, Big Breasts, Mother of All. Inky has relations with her, if you will. And in doing so, they create another goddess. There's a tree of life. And whenever they create these girls, they're the spitting image, or in the own image, or in the same image of their mother. So badly that it's believed that Enki, whether inhebriated or not, did not recognize the difference as the children grew up real quick in the story. It's just all of a sudden, boom, they're in their 20s and 30s or whatever, and they look just like their mom. Or just like their mom used to or whatever so he ends up having sex with this girl and they have another daughter and in the tale this happens three or four times it's a repetition thing and in doing so whenever they have that happen then Harsog finally gets very mad about the deal and if you haven't noticed yet this is a real big connection to Zeus and how he all the time has this flirty thing going on. You see, because people back then realized that they're talking about gods mating and people mating. And that's a demigod thing, like Gilgamesh and so on. And so you get that situation. Same way they looked at Alexander the Great or some of these human people that were demigods. It was kind of like a Jesus thing. But if you wanted to be God, gods, they have to end up breeding together. And because of what essence is and what they mean and what they control, that ends up making to where these two would be mating to make that. Sometimes it's not even the real wives of other ones, and they have to make up a story where she flirts around with so-and-so, and that made the god of the rivers, you know, and so on. Because that makes sense. She got with the god of the ocean, and that made the God of the Rivers. See how that works? I know people look at this and it's all promiscuous and weird, but it's uh, basically like how that might work out. Think about it as being a pseudoscience idea on religion, if you will. So in this idea, though, what's ended up happening is whenever... And then Harsog gets pissed off. The last daughter that this happens to out of the three or four, she ends up telling her, so you can see this all has to do with astrotheology, and when they're telling a story right here, and then the background of the stars that are in question, there's Anana's eight-pointed star and the moon. The star and the moon mean a whole lot of things, but 
whenever she t sees her and that Inky's gotten a hold of her again, she tells her to brush the seed off of her. Now, whenever she brushes the seed off of her, of Inky, it ends up like Johnny Appleseed or Jack and the Beanstalk. And lo and behold, it ends up forming seven new plants that are special but in saying special certain ones of these don't go together if you put these two and these two like together like ayahuasca it all of a sudden makes things happen but these others become a poison whenever put together you know that about narcotics and drugs and things nowadays so it's probably pretty easy to understand that, that concept here but these plants grow up and Inky hears about it and he's like oh I gotta go check them out so he checks out these plants and he goes wow so I'm gonna eat them so he eats them and he starts having what almost seems like a pregnancy when they describe it to you where he's you know sick and and just you know oh my gosh he's gonna die poisoned he's you know ruined here and they plead to Nin Harasag or the Queen of Heaven to come and save him now we're getting to the point where it really matters because when she goes and tries to save him she ends up putting him in her, her lap in a very Jesus type pose if you will and in doing so she ends up doing and taking away his separate afflictions in different levels now in doing so she creates other gods it's like the fix it for each of his ailments of the plants but in the essence of that plant it springs forth these gods and goddesses again one's Nikasi and it's the goddess of beer and so on who's actually related to a, an ancient innkeeper the goddess of innkeepers we're back here at the very first of Genesis so only a little of this sounds right to go with it just at this point yet until you find out that there's that pun and that secondary meaning of words that I talked about a minute ago because one of the gods that she ends up springing forth is called Ninti now Ninti and you can look this up Nin actually means goddess whereas in means male god a type form as in Inki they have symbols for the gods which is a star which shows you it's astro theological but this lady we're looking at the midriff of here going by is Ninti and there are dual meanings to the word T T-I in Sumerian now T means life but it also means rib and you see men have one less rib than a woman and people noticing this back in the day of yore ended up putting two and two together as a story and telling you that one of the man's ribs was used to make a woman now that sounds a whole lot like Adam and Eve, but hold on a second. This goddess of healing, and it's the one that takes the affliction off of Inky and saves him, is Ninti, and she's goddess of the rib. So this whole Adam and Eve story, and you wonder how a woman grows from a rib and eats from a magic tree because a talking snake told her to. Well, the magic tree is the halupa tree of Inanna, and there was a snake that was in there. There's also a bird that's no longer mentioned in the story and how it goes. But that has a connection to it, too. There's also another one about fruits in a garden and trying to teach you a secondary story about not stealing and doing things. But also, here's a secret. It was supposed to have shown you that 
You don't eat food of the gods. That's for them. Well, in your Bible, they can even tell you a story where they found out that people, by spreading a flower on the floor, were sneaking out and getting the food and eating that. Well, that's the priests. That's the way it always was. All of that food that you're supposed to do for the gods, they pretty much got the good cuts out of it and then burned the rest off so it wasn't a trash problem. But they made some great stories out of it, and it kept the priests alive. They were no farmers. They were no hunters. There were people controlling the people by religion. Here we are thousands of years later and we're finally able to peer through the veil and see how this all works. But Ninti basically transposes to, on the left, Lady of the Rib. But if you use the secondary connotation, this is Lady of Life who was caused by a rid, rib from Inky, not Adam. Now, Adam comes from the idea of Adama or Adamu that the Sumerians talk about too, and we've done videos about that too. But this right here on your right is a picture of Enkidu, like Tarzan, being taken by Jane in the tale of Gilgamesh. And how she feeds him. She has sex with him for a period of seven special days. And he used to be the friend of the animals. And they'd walk right up to him and saw him. In fact, where they found out about him was he was freeing animals from snares and traps and ruining those. And lo and behold, she turns him into a man. So, it makes no sense that a woman grows from a rib and eats from a magic tree because a talking snake told her to. But there it is right there. And it somewhat makes sense. Enough for people to believe it for a couple of thousand years now. But you'll find that this kind of story that this comes from goes back thousands of years before that and they learned this story in the Babylonian exile and by taking secondary forms of it the Greeks were able to turn it around into another telling of the same story just put together and a lot of it is Sumerian a lot of it is Egyptian there's a lot of Greek stuff in there as I've shown before too, but one thing that everybody keeps missing is the core of it ends up being Sumo Akkadian slash Levant and Anatolia and the ancient people that were running the shit over there. For this was all a Canaanite thing that all comes from the same essences in the first place. So if you you need another way to look at it here um java which corresponds to eve which really corresponds to hueva which is an egg which is the mother of all life but also a play on words and a pun is the name we give her in a modern day as Eve as being the mother that came before all Are you following me so the mother of life and Kava that comes out of here is Ninti and she is lady of the rib and she was created out of Inki where he had gone into a deep sleep and then Harsog takes and removes one of his ribs which creates her and she ends up being a healing goddess you can probably see a lot of the story in all of this can't you kinda wraps it all together a little bit and hopefully y'all can see what I'm talking about here and, and what it makes sense to.
and that a lot of this is Sumerian. These gods that have these horned helmets and so on that you see up here. And where that comes from. You know, I was a kid, I started finding out about this, and I saw the Flint, Flint, Flintstones, and there was the Grand Poobah, and he had the buffalo helmet, and I was like, what's the deal with all this? And everybody thought it was just Vikings, till so I got into it a little more, and I'm like, what? What's the symbology behind it? It took years, and I had to find esoteric knowledge people and Gnostics pretty much turned around and said it was the age of the Zodiacs. That's the reason these are bullhorns, and then later they're smaller and look like Aries, and there's all these connotations towards bulls, and then it changes to these connotations about lambs, and then all of a sudden it goes about fish whenever we come into the age of Pisces, and that's what you see Jesus with the Bible and doing the fish thing right off the bat, and it's still a symbol to this day, and people don't know why. Yeah, well, look at the symbols before that. They were Taurus and Aries, so here we go with Pisces, and now we're going back into Aquarius, which is one of Inky's signs, by the way. This is just one of thousands of connections, but I think it's one of the important ones because, you know, it's that very first thing where I hit a roadblock whenever I'm reading the Bible, and I'm like, what the hell is that supposed to mean where the woman grows from her rib and eats from a magic tree because a talking snake tells her to? There's a lot more to this. Again, this is the fourth time, well, this is the fifth time in which I've hit this exact same subject from different ways, and each time I tell you there's more, and I'll tell you now that I wasn't able to hit up on everything in even those five that are just in this first part, in this first story, that are woven into a tale. That's again why it's so amazing. Let me know what you think downstairs and we'll get on to the next showing of these connections. Peace.